Hello YouTube, in this video we're going to be discussing what we call the rational roots test that we use for polynomials when we solve polynomials, okay? So let's go ahead and start by reading what the rational roots test says in its very technical rigorous form, and then we'll talk about really what it means in general and why we use it. So we say if a polynomial f of x has integer coefficients, now this is kind of important that it has to have integer coefficients because if they don't, then this doesn't work, but if it has integer coefficients, then every rational zero, rational zero, of the polynomial must be of the form rational zero equals p over q. Now we'll get to p and q in just a minute. Notice that the base word of rational is ratio. That is, uh, we, we tend to define rational numbers as any number that can be written as p over q, where p and q are themselves integers, or that is whole numbers, okay, where q also is not zero. So the bottom line is this. We say, okay, so if I gave you a polynomial, like you see I've got listed two here. f of x is like, say, x cubed plus x plus 1, or over here g of x is x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8. Both of those have integer coefficients, and so it is the case that every rational zero or possible potential rational zero of these things has to be of the form p over q. Now, what I need to tell you is this. What the heck are p and q? So, starting with right here, we say p. What does p represent? Well, Given your polynomial, we say p represents all of the factors of the constant term. So for example, with f down here, we see that the, the constant term is 1, whereas up here with g, we see the constant term is 8. But we'd say uh, p represents all the factors of that constant term, where q, now q, we say so p, uh, q is all the factors of the leading coefficient. So in the first instance, we say the leading coefficient is 1. Up here with g of x, we also have a leading coefficient of 1. I'm going to start you guys off with training wheels. But, but essentially, Here's what this is, okay? Uh, we're getting to a point, hopefully, if you're watching these videos, where you're going to be asked to solve polynomials of higher degree. That is, like, degree 3, degree 4, degree 5. It depends upon how mean your math teacher is, but degree 6 or 7 even. And the bottom line is we need to use all of our knowledge of polynomials to be able to find zeros. And looking at both of these polynomials, f and g, you'll notice that I've given us things that are really, 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 well, let's face it, not factorable. So here's what we can do. We could just basically, if it's not factorable, we could try to uh, find factors that go unevenly by using synthetic division, but you'd sit there and you'd probably be guessing forever and ever and ever what zeros would go in, okay? So where should we start, okay? Well, this, the rational roots theorem, what it does is it gives us a place to start. It says that, look, if it's not factorable, you could sit there and long divide or synthetically divide till you find something that goes in evenly, or, or you could make a list of things that I can tell you right now are the only potential rational zeros that could go into it. So for example, here with f of x, let's go ahead and write out, using our rational roots theorem, all of the possible rational roots for this, okay? And I always tend to tell my kids write RR, okay? So we're going to write the set of possible rational zeros for this. So uh, we'll draw our fraction bar here. We say on top will be p, on bottom will be q. So we say all the factors of our constant term represent p, okay? So knowing that our constant term this time was 1, we say, what are the factors of 1? I usually get 1, you know, 1 times 1, but I want you to also consider this negative 1 is also a factor of 1. So we say the factors of the constant term in this case are plus or minus 1. We'll just write a plus or minus. That's it. They're the only factors of 1, and, and you know, so on and so forth with these, these factors over here, 1. Okay, plus or minus 1 is the factors of my leading coefficient. So basically what this list says is that if there are any rational zeros of this polynomial, it's either going to be a positive 1, 1 over 1, or, you know, positive 1 over negative 1 or something like that, negative 1. Those are the only two possible rational zeros that could possibly go into this according to the rational roots test. So what we could do is this. We could say, all right, well, now that I have this, uh, we could load up our synthetic division array, dropping in our coefficients. We say 1x cubed, 0x squared. Don't forget those. 1x to the first and 1 constant. We say, oh, why don't we try to divide out 1? Okay, so uh, one dropping one in here, we see, okay, does it go in evenly, you know? Uh, bottom line is this, we say one, uh, one times one is one, zero plus one is one, one times one is one, one plus one is two, one times two is two, and one plus two is three. So now looking at this right here, this means two things to me. First of all, it means that when I divide it, oh man, we got a remainder. What does this mean? It means that one is not a zero because our factor didn't divide in evenly. And also, according to the remainder theorem, this last three, you know, it, what it means to me is this. When I plugged x equals 1 into my polynomial, I was at a graph height of 3, okay? Which means I wasn't on the x-axis at a height of 0. That is, this is not a 0. 
So one doesn't work. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try negative one. We're gonna try negative one here. We say, okay, so one, zero, one, one. We'll load this up with a negative one here. I'll draw on a partition so we don't get these confused. Uh, we say, okay, so dropping down the one, we say one times negative one is negative one plus zero is negative one. Sorry, I'm going fast. Negative one times negative one is one. One plus one is two. Negative one times two is negative two. And then add these together, negative one. Oh man, again, we got a remainder. So negative one, it didn't work. It's not a zero. Uh, furthermore, we'd say this also means to me that when we plugged in an x value of negative one into the function, we're at a height of f of 1, negative 1, uh, at a height of negative 1. We're not at a height of 0. So, you know, starting off, I'm kind of trying to make a justification for why I'd make this list in the first place. This list, uh, basically with an unfactorable thing that has integer coefficients, allows us to have a list of potential things that would work. And you notice that both of the things on the list here failed. So what does this mean? It means two things. It means that my degree 3 polynomial, which, by the way, can have at most, at most, three real zeros, but if not three, can have one. According to the fundamental theorem of algebra, it has to have exactly three complex zeros. It means this, the zeros must not be rational. I must have irrational zeros. So now, before we take a look at g of x, let's just be honest with ourselves here. Whenever you're doing problems like this, yes, we're going to use our rational roots test to write out a list of potential you know, rational zeros that go into it. But the bottom line is, you would always graph this first. Okay, so let's go take a look at the graph of what we would have had here. We said x cubed, x cubed, plus x, plus 1. So now, we have our cubic thing here. You'll notice that it only has, it only has one real zero, and that occurred right about, oh, somewhere between zero and, and, and negative one there. What we can say about this is that number must not be rational. It must be a, a non-terminating decimal. It must have had radicals involved with it somehow. And since it had only one real zero, the other two zeros, since it had to have three total, must be complex. Okay, so moving right along to our next one, actually what we're going to do is we're going to start with the graph like a normal person. Anytime we do these, we should always start with the graph. And if you're a math teacher out there watching my vids, I'm really sorry, but let's face it, we're going to use technology on that ACT. And uh, really, this is a good test to get used to for when we start looking for irrational things. But you notice already, my cubic thing here, ooh, baby, we've got three zeros. And it's pretty blatantly obvious to me right here that I've got a zero in negative one, positive two, and positive four. Okay. So now let's go back over to our Photoshop here. And we say, all right. Let's say we didn't have a graphing utility on us. How would I go about solving something like this? It's not factorable. I have no idea what zeros could potentially go into it. The best I could do is guess, unless I have my rational roots test, which says at least we could make a list of potential rational roots that would go into this, seeing as how my integer coefficients are all, well, my coefficients are all integers. So we say, okay, so rational roots. Start with that. We say R, R. We're going to make a list of things that we potentially could have go into it, starting with the factors of our constant term. Now, in this instance, we say the factors of 8 are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, and plus or minus 8. Uh, and then also this. We say the factors of the leading coefficient are 1. So if we said, uh, you know, looking at these all together in roster notation, roster notation, the set of potential zeros that could work are plus or minus 1 over 1, so 1 plus or minus, uh, plus or minus uh, 2 over 1, plus or minus 4 over 1, or plus or minus 8 over 1. Okay, so that being said, this would be a good list to start with. And we'd say, okay, so let's say I didn't have a graphing utility. The first thing I would do is I'd drop in all my coefficients, and I'd start synthetically dividing or synthetic substitution until I found something that gave me a remainder of zero. And honestly, if I said, give me your graphing calculators, we're taking a test right now, you'd all groan, and, and you'd say, okay, well, at least I might as well just start with the easy one. We'll start with one. So if I start with 1, and, and by the way, hey, check it out, check it out. We know 1 doesn't work, but I want you to see this. Um, we say, okay, so 1, 1 times 1 is 1. That adds up to negative 4 there. 1 times negative 4 is negative 4. That plus that is negative 2. Negative 2 times positive 1 is negative 2, and we get 6. So this means two things to me. First of all, it means that 1 left a remainder, and it means also that at x equals 1, my graph, my graph was at a height of 6. Look at that. We know this. It's not on the x-axis. So the moment that one fails, well, you know what we'll do? We'll just we'll go try negative one. Okay, that's that's okay. So one's off my list. We'll go scribble that out. We say try negative one. So here we go. We say okay, dropping this into my array. I still have the same coefficients of my original polynomial: one, negative five, two, eight. Uh, we're gonna try negative one now. Here we go. We know negative one's gonna work because we've seen the picture. Like you know, we would go look at first, honestly. 
So negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. Negative 5 plus negative 1 is negative 6. Times negative 1 is positive 6. Plus 2 is 8. Check that out. Negative 1 times 8 is negative 8. And we get nothing. So good news. We have a remainder that is nothing. We have no remainder. This also means this. When x was equal to negative 1, my graph, my f value at that negative 1 was 0. It means we have an x-intercept. And furthermore, we say we've just found a 0 of this function. So now using our fundamental theorem of algebra that says, hey, look, you're supposed to have three zeros. Now you can have three real ones or one real one, but you have to have three overall. So you found a zero here. Negative one is one of your zeros. You got two more to find. Whoa, excuse me. You got two more to find. So looking at this now, what would I do in this situation? Well, hey, look at your quotient. We'd say we have one x squared minus six x plus eight. The bottom line is once you divide out that linear factor, the thing you're left with is much easier to factor than what you started with. So as soon as we start dividing out factors that work, or zeros that work, we're going to be left with something that probably, check this out, you could factor on your own anyways. You don't have to keep going through and, 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 and doing synthetic division. We say, well, then x minus 2, x minus 4 is 0. That must mean that 2 and 4 were also zeros, which we knew before we started this were going to be zeros. But the bottom line is, this test, the rational roots test, gives us a list of zeros to start by testing. And that being said, just know this, in my next few videos, we're gonna be graphing the stuff first anyways to see which ones on that list are gonna work, okay?